What if you can give AI the ability to start figuring out answers to your questions before you even ask them? It turns out that's very possible. And a team of researchers just published a research paper showing exactly how to do it. Now, I made a video a while ago going over a paper and open source project called MemGPT. It was really one of the first papers and projects to think about giving agents more sophisticated memory. And the MemGPT team got together and actually started a company. It's called Letta. And now that same team just published this new paper. And it turns out with sleep time compute, basically enabling AI to think even before you prompt it allows for a much lower cost of compute and in certain times, even better quality. We introduced sleep time compute, which allows models to think offline about the context before queries are presented. And if that doesn't make sense yet, I'm going to explain all of it. So first they talk about test time scaling and how test time scaling is essentially everywhere. It has been identified as a new scaling law. Basically the more test time compute you throw at problems, the better the output from the models. And if you're not familiar with test time compute, it is essentially those thinking models. O1, O3, DeepSeek, Gemini 2.5. Those models reason and think by outputting these thinking tokens and essentially reasoning through their output before actually giving you the output. However, there are two main problems with test time compute. Number one, it's slow. The thinking takes time. And that's okay for really hard problems, but if you're latency constrained in your use case, the thinking time could be very meaningful. We're talking about minimally seconds all the way up to minutes. And all of that thinking time requires GPUs running and processing those thinking tokens. And so test time compute tends to be very expensive. So that's what they talk about in the introduction. Improved performance from test time compute comes at a significant increase in latency and cost, waiting potentially several minutes for answers and costing up to tens of dollars per query. But why is all that processing needed at test time? These drawbacks are in part due to the fact that the current approach to applying test time compute assumes that problems are stateless. Essentially, the models have to start over and understand the context every single time they run inference against your prompt. Queries, your prompts, and the context, the background information, such as documents or code bases, whatever you're prompting with, required for answering them are provided to the model together at test time. In practice, and according to this paper, this is especially true if you have multiple queries that are essentially querying the same context. So let's say you load up a code base and you wanna ask questions about that code base. Even if you're using prompt caching, the model is still having to do a lot of redundant computation. But as it says here, in reality, many LLM applications are inherently stateful and work in conjunction with persisted reused context. There are some really obvious use cases, again, code bases or document processing and document Q&A, video processing. There's really a number of use cases in which an LLM shouldn't need to start over from scratch every single time. And here they point out documents question answering as a classic example. Coding agents also operate on a large common repository and conversational assistants need to maintain the dialogue of the past. What if rather than providing the full raw context to the model every single time to process, we did some processing beforehand, before you even prompt the model. That's the diagram we're seeing here. So we have our raw context here. A juggler can juggle 800 balls. One fourth of the balls are tennis balls and half of the tennis balls are indigo of which one tenth are marked. So here is the raw context and with standard test time, we pass the entire raw context plus our questions. So how many marked indigo tennis balls are there? How many tennis balls are there? and the model processes it in full every time. However, with their sleep time compute strategy, we take the raw context and we have a learned context. It basically uses AI to do pre-processing on the context and figure things out about it very similar to how the human brain works. So from this raw context, here's some things that the LLM figured out before it was even prompted for the first time. A juggler can juggle 800 balls. Great, that's what it says there. A quarter of the balls are tennis balls, which means there are 200 tennis balls. Half of the tennis balls are indigo, resulting in 100 indigo tennis balls. So it's basically figuring out things that you're most likely to ask of that context, and it pre-processes it. And 
Why is that important? Why is it better to pre-process versus just doing it at test time? Well, when it's done at test time, it can be 10 times more expensive for that GPU usage. When the model has a strict deadline to return an answer to you, that is the most expensive time of that GPU. Now think about how GPUs are used. When you prompt a model, the GPU is going, it's processing. But when it's done, it just stops, it just waits. And that waiting time could be used. And because we're dealing with essentially supply and demand, the demand of the GPUs at the time that you're prompting the model is much higher than it would be than the time where those GPUs are essentially asleep. So after the learned context, we ask the same questions. How many marked indigo tennis balls are there? And rather than having to go through the whole chain of thought, reprocessing everything, it just says the answer is 10. How many tennis balls are there? The answer is 200. So as you can see here, the total amount of processing may be similar, but a lot of it is pre-processed during a much less expensive processing time. So put more clearly by the paper, we could make useful inferences about the current state, the context, the information we provide the model, offline before or even during the user's next input. And we call that sleep time compute, where inference is done between interactions with the model while it would otherwise be idle in sleep time. And you know what you shouldn't sleep on? The sponsor of today's video. Thanks to the sponsor of this segment, Mammoth. Access the best generative AI for just $10 per month. This includes the best LLMs like Claude, DeepSeek, GPT-40, Llama models, Mistral, Gemini, Grok, and reasoning models like DeepSeek R1 and O3 Mini. And for that same price, it also includes the best image generation models, Midjourney, Flux Pro, Recraft, Dolly, Stable Diffusion, all in one place. And you can create custom Mammoose to help you on your projects. These are kind of like agents. And you give them all your custom context and they will know what you need them to do. You can install it on any device, Apple, Android, Windows, Linux, you can do one click reprompting and so much more. So definitely check out Mammoth. They've been a great partner to this channel. Tell them I sent you links down below. Now back to the video. All right. So how does it actually work? I showed you the basics. Let me go a little bit deeper. This is achieved by prompting the model to generate a new context consisting of inferences about the existing context. Basically, take this set of data, this document, this code base, and figure out connections between it. Figure out potential questions that might be asked against this data. The re-represented context from sleep time can then be provided in the prompt at test time. So all those things that you just figured out while you, the GPU, would have otherwise been asleep, now provide that as the context to the model so that it doesn't have to do all of that additional processing at test time. Enabling the model to respond to user queries at the accuracy of standard test time compute, but with far lower latencies. So a specific example, coding assistant at sleep time may identify architectural patterns, anticipate potential debugging strategies, or infer optimizations prior to the user input. And this is especially useful for when a user is going to ask multiple questions of the same context. And so they actually go further and say, you can amortize the cost of sleep time compute and reduce the total average cost per query. Basically what they found is for most cases, sleep time compute was able to match or beat the quality of test time compute using five times less resources. They also figured out that they can scale sleep time compute. The more compute they do at sleep time, the better the results. And they were able to improve their results by 13% and 18% on their two different benchmarks that they tested against. And by amortizing sleep time compute against multiple queries, basically doing that pre-processing once and then allowing multiple queries to use that pre-processed context, they were able to reduce the average cost per question by two and a half times. It's not all perfect. There are a couple cases in which test time compute is still better. And I'll explain that in a moment. All right, so let me talk about the benchmark that they used. They used two different benchmarks. I wanna show you what they did converting a stateless benchmark, which is what they are currently, to their stateful benchmark. And I'll show you what that means. So here's the stateless benchmark. The user is giving a query to the LLM. So here's the juggler one again, and it includes the question, how many marked indigo tennis balls are there? Now that 
which typically would be the benchmark, can be split into context, the juggler information, and then the query, how many marked indigo tennis balls are there? So we can start processing on the context before we give the AI the query. And the models that they tested this against are both reasoning models, test time compute models, and non-reasoning models. So O1, O3 Mini, Claude 3.7 Sonnet Extended Thinking, DeepSeq R1 for the reasoning models, and GPT-40 Mini and GPT-40 for the non-reasoning models. Let's look at some of the results. All right, so we have two different graphs here. We have the P1 version and the P2 version. P1, easier questions. P2, harder questions. So you can think of it as less compute, more compute. And this is for GPT-40 Mini and GPT-40. So first, let's start with the baseline, the gray dotted line right here. And this is GPT-40 Mini not using sleep time compute. On the y-axis, we have the accuracy, so higher is better. On the x-axis, we have have average test time tokens per question. How many tokens are needed at test time to answer the question? So higher doesn't necessarily mean bad, but it means more expensive. And what we see is first, the more thinking it does, the better the results. But we knew that test time compute is awesome. But look what happens when we add sleep time compute in. It is a substantial increase when the question requires fewer tokens to output. So we see a substantial increase here, but as we continue and more tokens were used for the response, we actually see that finally test time compute starts to perform better. Same thing with GPT-40, essentially the same curve. And for harder questions, we're seeing the same thing over on the right side. But how do they even test this on a non-reasoning model, a model in which they can't directly control the amount of compute that it's using during its thinking period? Well, for non-reasoning models, 4.0 and 4.0 mini, to vary the amount of test time compute, we construct prompts that instruct the model to use different amounts of verbosity at test time. So for example, answer directly with a single sentence versus double check your reasoning before outputting the final answer. And remember, chain of thought was just a prompting strategy before it was essentially built into the reasoning models directly. And as I mentioned earlier, at lower test time budgets, the performance of sleep time compute is significantly better than the baseline, achieving performance comparable to that of the baseline with five times less compute tokens. Now, how about for the reasoning models? Well, it turns out, Kind of the same thing. When the models use less thinking, sleep time compute is much better. So for easier questions, sleep time compute is much better, much cheaper. But after a while, allowing the model to think and think and think, they perform better overall. But that thinking comes at a substantial cost, a literal cost. Those GPUs are running and that costs money. And it's also running at the highest cost time for those GPUs to run, which is test time. So as we see here, here's O3 Mini, a substantial increase in accuracy up to about 6,000 tokens of thinking time. Here's Claude 3.7 Sonnet. Again, a substantial improvement in accuracy, basically up to about 20 plus thousand tokens of thinking time. DeepSeq R1 saw the same thing, and then O1 also saw the same thing. So ultimately, if you're trying to get the best performance, regardless of cost, test time compute and just ramping up the amount of test time compute a model does is the best way to go. But if cost becomes a factor, or you're not solving extremely difficult math problems or coding problems, sleep time compute is actually really, really good. Now, I know we talk a lot about test time compute, the reasoning time of a model before it gives you its answer. But there's another approach which is less talked about, which is parallel sampling. That basically means asking the model for multiple responses, multiple potential answers to your question, your prompt, and then you choose the best one. But there's a really big issue with parallel sampling. How do you know what the best one is? There is a huge assumption, and the reason why it's not nearly as popular as test time compute, that you know how to choose which of the multiple answers is the best one. And that's not always the case, and actually frequently not the case. So knowing that, keep that in mind, listen to this. We see that across all tasks and models, sleep time compute consistently outperforms pass at K, so that's parallel processing, at the same test time token budget, demonstrating that sleep time compute can be a more effective way to scale inference time compute than standard parallel test time scaling. All right, but how much can this sleep time pre-processing, basically allowing the models to figure things out 
when you're not even asking them questions, how much can that be scaled up? And so the way that they tested this is essentially scaling up the pre-processing budget during this sleep time compute. On reasoning models, we scale up the amount of sleep time compute by varying the reasoning effort for O1 and O3 mini when applying the sleep time compute prompt. Scaling sleep time compute on this benchmark shifts the performance outwards, improving it by 13% at similar test time budget. So the same amount of thinking when you're actually querying the model, but more pre-processing allows it to perform much better. So with tasks with more complicated context, additional sleep time compute can be beneficial. Here's what that actually looks like. Here's low effort sleep time compute, medium effort sleep time compute, and then up here, high effort sleep time compute. So the accuracy increases as you're giving it more time to pre-process during sleep time. All right, and we talked about amortizing the sleep time compute against multiple queries. Let me just explain that in basic terms. You do this pre-processing once and you can query that pre-processed context multiple times without having to pre-process it again like test time compute would need to do every time. And here is the key. Here is why sleep time compute is such a potentially important breakthrough. Latency optimized inference can be roughly 10 times more expensive. That means when you're actually querying the model and everybody else is trying to query the model at the same time, that inference cost, that GPU running in that server is the most expensive it will ever be at that moment. That is the highest demand and the lowest supply. So what they did is they tried to figure out what that trade-off between sleep time and test time compute would be in real dollars. And they upweighted the cost of test time tokens because test time tokens are more expensive. Another thing they figured out is the more predictable the questions are based on the context that you're providing the model, the better sleep time compute works. This is because a big assumption of sleep time compute is that the context is going to inform the questions asked against the context. So let's look at this juggler example again. If the context is you're talking about how many balls there are, how many balls are tennis balls, how many balls are indigo, and how many balls are marked, and I'm gonna regret saying this, you're probably gonna ask about those balls. Now, if you randomly asked about the ocean, then all of that pre-processing wouldn't have helped that question at all. And so what they figured out, we hypothesized that sleep time compute may be most effective in settings where the query is more predictable from the context. And they actually wanted to figure out if that's true or not. And here's what they found. So as we move up the X axis, what we're seeing is more predictability about questions based on the context. And what we're seeing on the Y axis is accuracy. So the more predictable the questions are, the higher the accuracy using sleep time compute. And that's basically what we're seeing here as well. However, again, for P2, which are more difficult questions, the increased performance becomes less clear for sleep time compute. All right, so overall, what are the findings? Well, sleep time compute works quite well in some cases. So in settings where the queries are challenging to predict or unrelated to the context, sleep time compute will be less effective. And that makes sense. If you're doing all this pre-processing before you even know the question and the question is unrelated to everything you just pre-processed, none of the work you just did matters. And they actually say an interesting direction for future work is identifying which context may have predictable questions and optimally allocating inference compute between sleep time and test time across different contexts and queries. And there's a lot of other cool findings that I didn't go over directly in this video. I encourage you to check it out. I'm gonna link this paper down below. And by the way, if you wanna see more research paper breakdowns, be sure to check out our newsletter, forwardfuture.ai. Awesome originals, news roundups, research paper breakdowns, interviews. I highly recommend checking it out, forwardfuture.ai. So if you enjoyed this video, please consider giving a like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.